So the title was uh, given by Paul, uh, Global Paramedics, True Polar Wonder and Plate Tectonics. And um, I'll just start. This is not meant to, uh, to be a um, kind of in introduction to, to the base of Palimag. I just want to say that um, the kind of basic assumption we make is that uh, the Earth's magnetic uh, axis is aligned with the rotation axis. And uh, you're probably aware that this is not really true. Uh, there is an offset today about 11 degrees, but over uh, two or 3,000 years, it's slow slowly processing around them. Um, the Earth's rotation axis. So on average, if you, uh, let's say you sample lava sequences for a few thousand years and you take a mean of them, you, you will have a magnetic axis which is more or less aligned with, um, with the Earth's rotation axis. This is called the actual dipole uh, hypothesis and this is uh, one of the most um, important hypotheses we use. This is almost uh, I questioned this hypothesis some years ago, but that was not very popular. This is actually to uh, almost question the decay constant in isotopic system. So for, this, for the purpose of this talk, we assume that it's aligned with, um, with the rotation axis. <coughs> so this is um, just an example of, um, of uh, how we portray this thing. Uh, one of the most important things in paleomagnetism is not looking at at a compass to see if it points north and south and you know the deviation from that is called declination but the most important thing in paleomag is actually the dip of the magnetic field or the inclination so if you have a volcanic eruption on the equator or a very low latitude like Hawaii this dip is very shallow if you come up to my part of the world in Oslo it's much steeper and it will point down and um, hypothetically if you're on the North Pole uh, it should point straight down. So this is the, this is the, um, this is the kind of the most important thing in Palimag really. It's the dip angle. So if you had an eruption on the equator and just later move to a different latitude, we go and drill and and study these rocks. We can actually figure out that it came from the equator. So it, so the dip of it, and then it, so when you have a lava eruption, maybe it cools to about a it, it comes up very hot at about 800, 900 degrees. When it cools below a certain temperature, this lava has, has a little um, magnetic particles, and the lava would typically be titanomagnetized. And when they cool below a certain um, temperature, what we call a Curie temperature, they would be locked into the rock and hopefully stay like that. There are secondary processes which uh, makes noise for us, but ideally when they are locked in, they could be preserved for a very long time. And it's really only one formula we have to re relate to, and this they figured out in the 1950s. If you measure this inclination, the tangents of this inclination is two times the tangent, or actually the latitude it erupted. So this is very simple. We go and drill these rocks, we measure this inclination, and it gives us the latitude when it erupted. So basically one formula to remember in this game. <coughs> do a little history. Uh, the first, uh, it's now 100 years since Wegener proposed the continental drift. It was in January 1912, but we know it took a long time for this to be accepted. And uh, before seafloor spreading and plate tectonics, the paleomagnetists were, were keen on looking into this thing. And this is um, what we call a polar wonder part. It's simply when, uh, when you drill a rock today, which erupted, let's say it was in Oslo, Hawaii, doesn't matter, you measure the declination inclination, and based on the side, latitude, longitude, you can calculate what we call a pole, palimagnetic pole. And as a time average, that should be the North Pole or the South Pole. So if you go and look at all rocks, what they figure out already in 1954, so this is Crea, Irving, and Rancon, these are all English from Cambridge University, when they looked at rocks from uh, from southern England, they call it a polar wonder part from Europe, which is kind of a little misleading because it was it was actually from England, and it was there's a lot of interesting things. But what they call a Cambrian pole and Cambrian today would be something like 500, 520 million years, and they had a Silurian pole, Devonian, Permian, just about 300 is pole here into Triassic. But what I noticed that when they looked at palimagnetic 
poles in old rocks, they noticed they didn't coincide with the present north or south pole. So, but they didn't, they didn't conclude for continental drift. They actually concluded, because there are two options here. You can either say the continent moved, Britain in this case, or you can say actually the continent was fixed and actually the spin axis moved. And actually in the very first paper, of probably one apart from Europe, they actually concluded that the spin axis had moved and not the continents. Uh, and that's what we call true polar wonder. So that, that's um, part of my title, because true polar wonder is always something we have to consider. So in this very first paper, they, they call it uh, true polar wonder. <coughs> and this is just an example. They had two possible explanations. Remember, continental drift was not accepted at all. The continent moves, or what we call apparent polar wonder. Or, cont or continental drift, or the poles move, which we call true polar wonder. So this is just an example. Uh, if the poles move, you have the fixed continent, and you are actually observing that the spin axis is moving, or actually the continents are moving. So they concluded for true polar wonder in this case. This was just for one continent, but before I go into uh, to look at more continents where we can distinguish between true polar wonder or continental drift. I just want to show some modern versions. So uh, Rob Vanderbilt, you probably all know, is a very famous palymanatist. So here is his polar wonder passing numbers here now, and you can see these creator are there are some resemblance here, but it's very, very different. So this is from 1990. This is one I did with Rob Vanderbilt in 2012. It looks a little different also from Rob Vanderbilt. So thing, things are changing with time. We get more data. We have better methods. <coughs> and uh, it now looks very, very different from the original career. When we have these poles, just mentioned uh, two, two common ways of generating polar wonder parts. One is called a running mean. It's simply you, you bend them into, let's say, 10 and 20 million, take, take, um, take an average and, and move these windows. So that's what we see here. This is a simple running mean. I normally use 3D spherical splines, but the problem, these are far more difficult for others to reproduce, so sometimes I, I do both, to be sure. So this is what it looks for, for, looked for Europe up to recently. So the first polar one apart from Europe was in 54, but in 1956, Rancon actually had polar one apart for two continents, he had for Europe in orange and North America in yellow, and they differ. So this is the first solid evidence for continental drift in 1956. So he didn't go for true polar wonder any longer, but he actually concluded this is continental drift. And the difference between them was simply, I will show you later, Europe and North America had been together, let's say, f since about 425 million years ago. Uh, there was some pre-drift extension. But the basic difference in this curve here is the modern opening of the North Atlantic, which uh, in this case turned out to be about 38 degrees, almost like a bullet fit. And uh, here is an example from Rob doing this kind of exercise. If you look at Europe and North America today, and if you close them for the modern opening, they're kind of, they are kind of superimposed. So this is actually the first, what you can call geophysical evidence for, um, for continental drift already in 1956. So this is one year before I was born. <clears throat> Just again, to emphasize these, what we call apparent polar wonder parts have changed dramatically over the past decade. So here we see the career. He had the option that the, either the pole, pole moves or I've actually reproduced them here. If it was continental drift, it will show how actually how the British Isles came from the Southern Hemisphere, came to, it was on equator here in the Devonian and Permian, and then slowly drifting northwards to where it is today. And this is my latest polar wonder part from Europe. They're very different, and uh, not surprisingly, Ken Creer had actually only six paramagnetic poles. In my last one here, there was 167. Of course, they wasn't aware that rocks actually can be remagnetized, so the primary main station is not, not always uh, preserved, but also we, we have a better way of treating these rocks now and also better analytical. In some way, uh, there are some other problems here. 
what they called Europe or England, actually what they called Camp, pre -camp they also had a Precambrian pole, but that was actually from Scotland. And I'll show you later, Scotland wasn't part of England uh, at that time, it was actually part of North America. Uh, and they also, the Cambrian pole here is also kind of funny, because that's actually from southern England, and we know now southern England wasn't part of um, <coughs> Of, of the rest of England uh, in, at the time, but they were part of a continent we call Avalonia, and I will show you this a little later. So in some funny way, if you look historically of all this compile, only the Permian, the Permian poles he has here is actually from some, what we call the Exeter lavas in England, there are about 20 million years. It's the only pole which actually resembles what we, what, what we find now. So before I, I look at these things here, I'm so, just say this observation of Crayer, we know they are faulty, but had a fundamental and long-lasting impact. And for more than 50 years since the pandemic had been used to create a you know, time scale, document sequel spreading, and to validate plate tectonics. But this is the really crucial thing. They were right for the wrong reason. Actually, they had only one data point, which actually looks like today. But they had intuition. Maybe they thought this is what it should be. And um, I, I always said they were right for the wrong reason. And here I'm just pointing out, uh, we'll come back to some, here's a reconstruction for the early Ordovician. You're looking at the South Pole. So you see one of the data points from Crea were actually part of southern England, which was actually part of Gondwana. They were fringing the margin there. He had a Precambrian data point, actually part of Scotland, which was part of Greenland and North America, or what we call Laurentia. And... Um, so at this time, in the early Eurovision, you had this big Gondwana continent, French by Avalonia, southern England, big ocean, we call the Apetus, separating Scotland uh, and um, Greenland and North America, and then you have my own favorite plate, Baltica, some sort of uh, in the middle here. So here's the equator in the South Pole, so most of the continent actually in the Paleozoic was in the, in the in the southern hemisphere, and for most most time there was actually hardly any continent in the northern hemisphere. Just also a preamp here, before you can actually start combining, if you're going to make a polar wonder part from the British Isles, you can only do that from about 420 million years, because then that's Avalonia or southern England has collided with Laurentia, and you actually form a coherent plate. So, you see, so considering all what we know now, it was just amazing they even managed to make polar wonder parts from these two uh, by mixing all these uh, things. So it's, um, it's really right for the wrong reason, this. Just an example, I'm going to go into a little what we can do with parameter data. I told you inclination is uh, one of the most important. We can take... Um, Parameter data from one plate, and here I show Baltica. So what we get out of it is latitude through that equation I showed you earlier, and orientation. That's simply, we also measure the declination in the rocks, and the deviation from north-south would be a straight rotation. So you can see here, for instance, for Baltica, and you can see Norway in black here. So there's equator. If you go back to 500 million years, you see Baltica was upside down, and then it was rotating quite heavily, traversing into the equator, when it comes into the Silurian Devonian, and then it's been kind of happily been moving north uh, f f for the last 360 million years. So when we build these uh, diagrams I show you in the previous one, we, we're a bit, we have to go and do palymanetism of find all the rocks we can deal with. Sometimes we, there is also a lot of interpolation of data, but uh, we're building up these uh, from one continent at a time. So what can we do with this kind of data? I will come back to, we, we don't really know um, longitude, and I'll come back to that a little later. So what we really know is latitude, and we can do orientation. So the kind of calculations we can do uh, based on this latitude curve. So this is just taking, calculate for Oslo, 60 degrees north, so there's equator, so similar to the other diagram, but just showing the latitude of Oslo up to 60 degrees. What we can calculate for this is um, latitudinal drift rates. We just assume that we have no longitude movement. So this would be minimum plate velocity. So that's the kind of calculations we can do. 
So here is separated uh, in centimeter per year. If it goes north, it's plotted to the north of the zero line here, and if it goes south, uh, they're plotted southwards. So you can see Baltic has mostly gone northwards. And we can also, from them um, measuring the declination in these rocks, we can convert it into, for example, rotation in degrees per million years. We can separate it into counterclockwise and clockwise. So these are the kind of um, calculations uh, we can do with parameter data. So no longitude involved here. But I will come back to a little later that we, we, have, we have some analytical tricks to deal with, um, with longitude. So this is the same diagrams I showed before. So we, I just show you from one from Baltica here, and we can do a similar thing for um, Laurentia through time, and also from Gondwana, which was fringed with Avalonia here, and we can build these um, paleogeographic maps. So what 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 is really we know from these maps? It's the latitude, which comes from the inclination we measure, and the rotation, which is based on the declination. And I just show you we can calculate north-south plate velocities, these are minimum velocities, and angular rotation. But an advantage of Palimag is that it can be used probably throughout biological history, or uh, at least back to the Archean, maybe three, three and a half billion years. So that's an advantage to many other methods, like um, if you're going to do magnetic anomalies, which are relative fits, you, you probably all know that the oldest Magnetic anomalies are about 170, 180 million years, so that's as far as you can take it. If you're going to use the hotspot tracks, the oldest are about 130 million years. So if you, if you are only using these methods, you can never speculate before the Cretaceous. So Paleomag really takes you way back into the Precambrian. But there are uncertainties. We don't know longitude. So when I plot Baltic air, for instance, I could, for instance, just drag it around on the same latitude down here towards Avalonia, I could move it the other way here. And um, this is one of the reasons why I work with paleontologists and this, this, and we also know that there should, we also know when oceans were there and when things collided roughly. So that kind of gives us some sort of relative longitudes. For instance, in this time, the trilobites were very different from Baltica, very different from Gondwana, and very different from Laurentia. So we assume we had very large and big oceans there. And this Iapetus Ocean here is at about 5,000 kilometers at this time. But it's not quantitative. It's, it's uh, just a semi-quantitative analysis. <coughs> so what I've been talking about, making these paleography maps, is, is something I've been working on for 25, 30 years. More lately, I'm more interested in um, trying to qu quantify Earth in a better way. And one other thing I'm going to talk about now is not only just making um, a polar wonder part from a single plate, but I, I want to make a global polar wonder part where I combine them all. So here's the acronym we're using for that in parent polar wonder part. If we have a global, we call them gap web. Now that's our definition of a global polar wonder part. And it's simply, you take a parent bonus from many continents and you rotate them through plate motion change. So we have to know the relative uh, motion here now, and we rotate them to one common reference plane and combine them into a global apparent polar wonder part. This, this procedure here is, can really only be done since Pangaea time. So that's why I put this line on here. Because from Pangaea time, and that is about 320 million years ago when they first came together, that's when we have a reasonably idea about the, the plate motion change. Not as good as we can get them from um, magnetic anomalies back to 170 million years, but we have a pretty good idea. So, for instance, here I show reconstruction 150 million years, and Africa is fixed here now, and I just show you the way we compile this together, so, so these, are the, these are the plate motion chains. And for instance, if I'm in Europe, I have to first correct for pre-drift extension in North Atlantic and the modern opening, and I go into Greenland, then I have to correct for Labrador Sea, and then I go to North America. Then I have to correct for um, opening in the Central Atlantic for the last 190 million years, go into Northwest 
Africa, there are also internal movements in Africa, and we end up in South Africa. So all, all my global polar wonder paths are rotated to, Afri to southern African coordinates, and there is a good reason for doing that, which I'll come back to a little later. <clears throat> but it's also good when you are doing this analysis to rotate to a point which is somewhere in the middle of your Pangaea. So and imagine if you rotate them to Europe, for instance, if you get the last chain between Greenland and Europe wrong, everything will be affected. So it's, it's always good to rotate them to something which is in the middle of Pangaea. But, so this is the kind of procedure we will use for, use for the last 220 million years. Before that, we have to do some other schemes. So here is, um, you will see this um, little plot here many times. We have to compile all the plate circuits. So this is an example of 200 million years. And then I, I make a global reference frame on the, on the palymagnetics there for the last 20 million years. Then we have to do a true polar wonder correction. We'll come into that a little. And um, the only reason to do that, if you're only interested to know where the continents was and you want to you want to look into um, latitudes in terms of climate or whatever, you don't have to worry about true polar wonder. It's really, if you're going to relate it to something in the mantle or, or, in, or at the coronal boundary, we'll show you later, we have to correct for this. So then we got a global true polar wonder corrected reference frame. So I'll bring this gradually. I, I guess uh, some of you are familiar with G-plates, or you, you will be familiar with it. So um, the first step we do here, and I compile all the relative plate circuits, plate motion from Pangaea, and uh, this, is the, this is the data structure you will find, for instance, in G-plates. Uh, we have numbers now. We don't, we don't call them by name any longer. So if you're really going to learn G-plates properly, you have to learn all these numbers. They are not too hard. 301, for instance, is Durap, um, and w these files are built up like that. What plate uh, are you going to rotate? So this is Durap. What's the age? So this is from magnetic anomalies. Uh, and then you need an Euler pole, Euler latitude, longitude, and angle. And then relative to what plate? And in this case, I'm showing it relative to North America, not Greenland, actually. Normally, we go to Greenland and then but this is a direct comparison. So this is, um, this is how we build up these um, relative plate circuits. So again, how important, and I will stress it later, all plates are leads to South, South Africa in this scheme. So, this, so again, here the plate circuits all leads to South Africa. So if you're going to compile, if you're going to make these global and parallel one parts, you, you have to compile data from stable cratons. You, you cannot um, compile data from a nap or rocks with your upside down, etc. You, you have to compile them from, from, the, um, from the stable parts. So here you see from our latest analysis, there's about 500 data points there. And be aware, we have a global parameter database of something like 20,000 data points, and I would dare to say f from stable cratons, there, there's like five, 600 which are reliable, and the rest are not reliable. So uh, if you just scan our database uh, without really looking where they come from, what have been done to them, you, you will get some horrendous result. So you will see here for, um, for Baltica into England, we have quite a lot in Africa, not very much, a lot of trouble in Africa. A lot of trouble with weathering, lightning, some results from Madagascar, also not particularly good. We have um, from South America, also from North America. Few data points from Greenland, not very much. Siberia, you see here this up white area, these are all mobile bells, so I do not compile data from this region. India, Indian plate, and also Australia, but not very much from Australia, which I consider reliable. <clears throat> so this is um, the kind of database, and of course we have to put all these data together and, and rotate them into South Africa, which is our, um, our reference plate. There is another thing. You, um, I told you earlier, if you have a lava and it cools and, and you lock in the magnetic fields, you, 
a lot of these uh, da data are from sedimentary rocks, and there is a problem with the sedimentary rocks. It's well known. You can, you can do laboratory experiments. Uh, when, um, when you are settling grains, and they're already small magnetic, or you can look at it as small magnets trying to settling, and they will fight gravitational and hydrological forces. And we, we know there is an, what we call an inclination shallowing, that they, the magnetic... So they are not always truly recorded in magnetic fields, so at least some of us now are actually trying to correct them um, through a formula here, and um, we are used, for those who are familiar, what we call a flattening value, F here. It's not very important for this talk, but I correct all the sediments with a flat value of 0.6 when I do this analysis. So now I'm going to show you, I'm going to go a little before Pangea as well. When, to do a global one, you really have to, um, to do that uh, after Pangea's form, but I'm just going to show you now how we're, going to do, how we're doing this. Uh, here is Apollo 1, apart from Laurentia. Uh, you can see it in actually in two, uh, two different, these are running mean, all the one I show you. Uh, and the blue one are actually when we when we done these, uh, corrected for this uh, flattening uh, in sediments, and the red one, when you haven't done it, and you can see it's a little smoother, you got, it's a little more taggy if you don't do this correction. But you, in some places, there are very little difference, and that simply means that you have more um, igneous rocks there. And uh, when, when they deviate quite a lot, it probably means that you have a lot of sediments in the record. But they are not, they are not terribly different. So here you can see polar one apart for Laurentia, and this is now in North American coordinates. Here you can see our latest for, um, for Europe, so we're starting here in the Cambrian into the Ordovician. And you can see some sim similarities immediately. So here is about 430 million years, very similar. You can see this kink here in both of them. So you can immediately, even though they are in different longitudes here now, you can see that there are some similarities in these things. So that's uh, uh, Laurentia, which was on equator in the Olivician, and Baltica, which was in uh, intermediate southerly latitudes. And we now have to try to correct these, to, to bring them together, to, to, to make a, a joint part. <clears throat> so, and, and that we can do for, since 420, maybe 430 million years, when... Um, North America, Greenland has collided with Europe and Avalonia here, and we can combine them, and we can also see how well they fit. So here they are combined. You see Baltica here, and here you see Laurentia. They both have this little, this little hair, cusp here, some differences here, but, and there are also some difference actually in the Jurassic as well, but you've got an idea how good or bad these things are. But um, for instance, Many talks about big troubles in the Precambrian or maybe around here in the Carboniferous, but you can see even the Jurassic, um, there is some misfit between North America and, and Europe. Anyway, if you try now to combine them all into a joint one, so now we made actually when uh, Laurentia and, uh, and Baltica Europe collides, we call that Laurentia first and later you, Laurasia when also the Asian elements later on are collided. So this is what we can call a Laurentia polar wonder part. And now we, we made it into one single part. And again, this blue one when the sediments are corrected for this flattening and the red one when they are not corrected. So again, you can kind of, you see these error confidences on here. These are 95% confident um, ellipses and they are quite large. So you see whether we do this correction or not, they're mostly within error. So that was just to show you how you can combine uh, North America and Europe after 430 mi uh, million years. Uh, we can do similar for Gondwana. Gondwana, you can go further back. Gondwana was assembled at about 550, maybe 600 million years. And so all these major elements were together for a very long time. So we have Africa, Africa here, here's Madagascar, India, it's, it's turned around in a funny way, <coughs> and also Western Australia. And you can, you can take all the parameter data from all these blocks here, and now using these fits as you show here, and then I can make a, 
Apollo 1, apart from Gondwana, which starts here, and in the blue here is this where we corrected for this flattening thing in sediments. Now I got something funny on my screen. Sorry. Oh. Something internally happened. And um, yeah, I will click the next. My color disappeared. All right. <laughs> Anyway, this was examples just to show you before Pangea and um, and um, these Polar Wonder Paths were using generates these kind of reconstructions here in, in the Lake Cambrian. I told you Gondwana is in the South Pole. We have Baltica here. We have Laurentia down to Equator here. In the later Ordovician, I said England is down here. It drifts off. We open a new ocean called the Rake. Southern England or Avalonia collides with Baltica, and now you see it's, it's quite narrow, the Apidus Ocean to Laurentia. This collision is about 420, so if you go to the early Devonian, we have this Laurentia as one unit, and we have Gondwana as, an, as the second one. So we're basically looking at two big lumps of continents. And at 350 million years ago, we are very close together at Pangaea. So you can see Pangaea, which happened at about 320 million years, is really a collision between Gondwana and Russia, and then a lot of small blocks which are squeezed in between her. So it's a, it's a reasonably sensible um, scenario. <laughs> now I'm going to go to return to, to making a global since Pangaea, and um, by Combining all these polar wonder paths together now, I show you this GAPWAP or, or global polar wonder path, and it's now in southern African frame. It's and they are south poles, so that's why I have 60 degrees south or 30. So you will see this global path here from 320. So this is so this what is simply this polar wonder path really means is that you keep South Africa fixed and you just show how the poles move with respect to Africa. That, that's really what is polar wonder path, instead of showing South Africa moving through time. So we start here in the Carboniferous. You see the errors are now quite smaller because we have a lot of data when we compile them from all these continents. So you come through the Carboniferous into the Permian here, it's 250. Make some swings, funny back and forth, but it's uh, this is our global polar wonder part, almost of today. So th this is from, uh, from one of the papers I sent over earlier, which is um, in review at the moment. But it, it has gross similarity to some, some earlier one. So just to stress again, we do these plate circuits, and we create this palimetric reference frame, which you see here. So what, it look, what does it look like in, uh, if, you, if you open G plates? I'll show you earlier just an example of a relative fit. In this G plates file, uh, Southern Africa is 701, so that's our kind of key continent. And uh, when, when you generate a parameter reference frame, you see the H is there because I did a running mean and I moved the window in 10 million, so go from 0 to 320 in the end. And then we have Euler latitude, longitude, and angle. When you, when you first calculate the rotation poles for a continent from parameter data, the Euler latitude always zero. <coughs> so you really only have the, the, so it's zero always, and then you have um, Euler longitude and an angle. And now you'll see this, we normally relate, in, in G plates, we relate it to the spin axis, and we normally use one for spin axis, or zero, you can, you can do that as well. So this is what it would look like um, in, the, in the G plates file. Just to show you this thing about how we calculate these Euler poles, um, if I'm on Bortica today, so I'm sitting here in Oslo talking to you here now on 60 degrees north, if I did some palimonetic data, studied some rocks 250 million years, and I, here is the reconstruction of Baltica, and it's, it's further to the south, so here is 30 degrees. But what we normally do, we calculate the pole, so the pole, so this is a real example, will be here, and there is the confidence. What we simply have to do, we have to figure out what is the Euler pole, which will bring this planetic pole to the North Pole, in this case, or it could be in the South Poles. If you go back, um, figuring out what is it, 
north of South Pole is not too, too difficult since the Pangaea times. So we find the Cambrian. We don't really know when you when you drill these rocks and you calculate the pole. You don't really know whether it's the South or North Pole, and so that leaves a lot of freedom. But this is uh, the basic idea. You have a pole. You calculate the Euler pole, and it's always situated on the equator, and which brings it to the North Pole in this case. So we have this uh, global apparent polar wonder part now, which we, we which which is an essential feature going into G plates when when you want to go beyond um, Hotspot reference frames, and um, and of course it's built on the fact that we kind of uh, we have figured out the plate circuits there, and we can generate these reconstructions there, and we can use we can use this for what I call classic paleogeographic climatic reconstruction and uh, where the true relation to the spin axis is what we're really interested in. So we don't have, so if you only want to do that, and that's what most people want to do, you don't have to worry about uh, what we call true polar wonder. So uh, here's another example, just a 200 million year, so this is just before the breakup of um, of the Central Atlantic, so Pangaea still. It's basically going slowly northwards, Pangaea, after it's formed. And uh, it's just an example, 150 million years. You have the opening now of the Central Atlantic. Also just started the break up here. I said Gondwana was formed at about 550, 600 million years ago. And it really, except from all different terrains on the margin which rifted away at certain times, it really stayed together almost to this time here when what we can call the East Gondwana with Madagascar and Seychelles up here, one of my favorite islands, and India together with Australia and East Antarctica actually rifts off there. So this is the, um, this is the kind of the kind of first breakup of Gondwana in a big way. And this is just before the real breakup of uh, Pangaea which starts uh, now in the, in the Central Atlantic. So this is just a, another example, 100 million years, of course, now we also had opening of the South Atlantic. This started about 130 million years, and I just show this one because it propagated from, from the South to the North, and this is the first time you actually have a full connection between the Southern Atlantic and into the Central Atlantic. This is just an example at uh, 50 million years, or in the Paleogene. So again, these are, these are it's a kind of classic reconstruction where you really are interesting. What, what is the relation? Of course, we have the relative relation here, but also if you're, you want a true relation to the spin axis, that's what you're looking at. And if you also want to relate that to paleoclimatic studies. <clears throat> so again, I'm just emphasizing here, but then we have, now I'm going to talk a little about... Um, this issue here, true polar wonder correction, to actually get a global true polar wonder corrected frame, um, because that's important for uh, when you want to relate this to um, to what is actually below them, the lithosphere or the mantle. Also, if you want to do calculation of what we call net lithosphere uh, rotation to look at coupling between the mantle and the lithosphere, you must take away true polar wonder. Other guys, you get very very high values. You get very strong what we call toroidal components, so this has to be taken away. And you will understand that from some diagrams later. So what is true polar wonder? I'm not going to go into the, to the detail of it, but it's really... You can see motion of continents relative to the Earth's spin X may be due to either motion of individual continent, continents, or rotation of the entire Earth relative to its spin axis, which we call true polar wonder. So it's really the entire lithosphere and the mantle is rotating with respect to the spin axis. And if you remember in the beginning, in 1954, Creer, when he saw that the parametric poles different from today, he said, ah, it's true polar wonder. But then... Um, then um, Runcorn, two years later, said, no, it's not true polar wonder, it's continental drift. But in fact, what we know now, which makes life more complicated, it's a combination of both. So the continents are moving, but also the spin axis 
is also moving at certain time, and we have to we have to fig we have to figure out how how, how much uh, it's each of these contributing. So uh, again, here this is just to show you what is true. So uh, if you <coughs> if you have a, True polar wonder is shown here. If you have a continent, I just put two masses here now. So, so this is the this is the core. So I, I put two masses on the core mantle boundary sticking up. As you will see later, what I think they are. Um, so it, it, if all this is move, if these are moving together with a continent with respect to the spin axis, in this case you can see they all move. This is true polar wonder. Uh, if these things in the lower mantle here remain fixed, and the only the continents are fixed, then it's not true polar wonder. It can be a little mysterious, this true polar wonder, but one way we can see this quite easily, so, so here is my global apparent wonder part, which are, which are not corrected for true polar wonder. We started here in the Carboniferous into the Permian, and it shows some rather complicated feature before it comes in uh, through the tertiary here. One way to, to, uh, to, to detect this, this is from a paper in 2008, it's actually the first time we were able to quantify this with Bernard Steinberger, and one way we see this, we notice there are four faces. Um, you can see all the continents at this different times so actually it seems to be rotating around a point which is uh, almost or very near the equator. The definition of true polar wonder, if the spin axis, uh, is that this point has to be uh, also rotating on a point, on a latitude which has to be on equator. So you can see here at certain times through Earth history since Pangaea, you can see all the continents has this very strong toroidal rotational feel which seems to be centered very close to, um, and, and this has this has to be true polar wonder. It's nothing to do with uh, with continental drift. But you see, there is a mixture here. You know, we go back in time. Well, the continents are basically together in Pangaea. Here, things are breaking up. This is the last very important phase from uh, 110 to 100 million years. So this is what I consider is one of the last very, very distinct true polar wonder events. And you can see everything. So from uh, from uh, 110 to 100 million years, you can see the whole Earth uh, is uh, rotating. And now we also, there also, of course, we have continental drift. Uh, we've opened the Central Atlantic, and the South Atlantic is on its way. So here we see a mixture. And um, to correct for this true polar wonder is simply to figure out what, what is this, what is this toroidal component, which is um, which has to be close to equator. Uh, what is the size and magnitude of this thing, and we can subtract that from this polar wonder part and do this true polar wonder correction. So it's turned out not to be such a terrible... This is just a blow-up. This is how we first saw it, and it's also the advantage with computers today because you can do this reconstruction and we can, we can put on these velocity fields, and you can see here at 240 million years, this just projected 10 million into the future, and you can see this very strong um, counterclock rotation. And the, the only, and it's rotating on a point which is very close to equator. The, the, only, the, the only thing this phenomenon can be is that it's a true polar wonder. And this has to be corrected for if, if you're going to compare it to the mantle. <coughs> so here is... Um, Here is actually what it would look like, and um, you are the first to ever see these curves being corrected. As I don't think anyone's actually done it before. So here you see this global polar wonder part rotating all the continents together into South Africa, and as shown you before, if I correct for all these four faces, slightly updated from the diagram I saw, you you actually get a new polar wonder part, um, which. Uh, it starts off in the same area here, but it doesn't have this super complicated hair, kind of come into the Permian hair, and then it's kind of hoovering around, uh, and then Pangaea break up, and then it moves uh, similar to hair. So you, a lot of, some of this complexity in hair we relate now to true polar wonder. 
We can quantify true polar wonder, how much is it? Uh, this diagram here on the horizontal, you will see the time axis go back to 320, uh, and then we have a vertical scale here, which is actually total motion in degrees uh, of true polar wonder. But it's actually, a plot, I'm plotting this cumulative. So um, if I start in the Permian here, you, when, when, you, when you see it goes up here now, it, this is counterclockwise rotation, then it switched to clockwise rotation, a little more clockwise, then it's kind of stable, so when it's flat here, no, there's no cumulative, it means you have hardly any true polar wonder. And then we have this last phase here uh, between 110 and 100. And then there's very little here. And there is some in the tertiary, um, but it's kind of below 5 degrees. So it's not as high. You can see here it's up to 20 degrees cumulative effects. But the good news about true polar wonder if the spin axis was just moving the same way all the time, it would create a lot of trouble for us to correct for this. And the cumulative effect would be enormous. It would be enormous difference between uh, showing data without true polar wonder correction. The good news is going counterclockwise, clockwise, a little more clockwise, counterclockwise. So you can see that the cumulative effect from today to 320 million years is very small. It's just 4 or 5 degrees. So that's good news in some way. So this is just show you again. I show you this 240 million years without true polar wonder correction. After we do a correction, you will now see in this case here that Pangaeas actually have a period. I said most time, most of the time Pangaeas rotating s slowly northward, but you can see now it's it's a period actually where Pangaea is going slightly um, southwestward. So we have got rid of this toroidal component. So when we do this true polar wonder, it's important to look at these velocity fields to see to see how they that you actually got got rid of this um, toroidal field here. <coughs> and um, one of the motivation for doing this thing, um, if you're going to link anything on the surface to the deep interior. You need an absolute, we need an absolute plate motion reference frame, but if you're going to do this from Palimag, you have to, um, you have to correct for the true polar wonder. What I, I will show you now is it's a little uh, repeat of what I've said so far, but, uh, but to really quantitate uh, our planet, uh, I prefer to do a moving hotspot reference frame as far as we can go. So we can use them to about 130 million years. Then I want to switch to a planet reference frame. Because I've told you we, we, we don't really have a fix on longitude, but I will show you now we will use a little analytical trick. But what I call really global uh, absolute reference frame is actually trying to use um, moving, uh, moving hotspot reference frame or you can use fixed hotspot reference frame for that matter and then switch to a parameter reference frame. And I just want to show you now how, how we are doing this thing because um, if we're going to say anything on the lithosphere and how it can relate to the deep earth, and this is the way I look at the earth, um, it's a very simple earth, we'll come back to it uh, in the end, but it's basically a degree two earth or a two upwelling which are actually on the margin and, and above these um, thermochemical piles we have at the core metal boundary, these are perfectly antipodal. So two upwellings, two downwellings, so this is a degree two planet and, um, and to arrive on this kind of simple uh, way of looking at Earth is really derived from this way of, uh, of generating these absolute uh, reference frames. So this is more a motivation why we are doing this thing. So we call them hybrid reference frame, and the first one we did this was published in 2008. So this is um, this is one of the paper this um, lecture is based on. But this is actually the first time we're trying actually to link several uh, hosp uh, link hotspot and parameter reference frames. So we call it a hybrid reference frame. So it's a reference frame for absolute plate motion that is a combination of different reference frames from different time periods. So the first one we did in 2008, we used a moving hospital reference frame for the past 100 million years. But it's not really, it wasn't really a, we did a global moving hospital reference frame there as well, which we weren't 
terribly happy with, so we actually used actually what we call an Indo Atlantic by simply using by only using hospital tracks attached to to the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean for the past hundred million years, and then we switched to a parameter reference frame for all the times. So this is um, now it's a little more complicated. Up, oh, oi! Now I lost my oh oh. Okay, I think I missed one, but that's okay. So uh, step A, which I missed a little, but I've been through it before, is simply we have to get all these uh, plate circuits. Uh, so step B here now, in, instead of going straight to the panoramatic, we we, um, we calculate absolute plate motions based on Hotspot track back to 130 million years, where it really only goes to 124, 125. But but we make it in a way that that all the tracks uh, are. Um, are rotated to the South African plate and then average. So this is our latest model now. We're actually using five hotspot tracks. We use Hawaii, uh, and um, I'm sure you're all aware that if you if you do a model from uh, from the Indo-Atlantic, you fit the, let's say in the South Atlantic, you fit the Tristan, or you fit the the um, Reunion hotspot in the Indian Ocean. So here is Reunion going up here, and then it, it, it was under the, um, the Indian plate up to 55 million years, I would say now. If you purely construct a reference frame there and you rotate it into the, um, to the Pacific, most of these parts would, would not actually catch the band there, but they go, go almost straight through there. Uh, in this latest model now, we are kind of getting the band, uh, the band there reasonably well up to 70 some million years. I can't really see it on the screen here. But, so we use Louisville, Hawaii, Tristan, Reunion, but also the New England Seamount. So we have five of them now for our latest moving uh, hotspot uh, reference frame. And uh, we are using this to now to 100, and not 230, but to 124 million years. So this is gonna be our absolute, and what I mean absolute, and absolute latitude and longitude. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to mix that with a parametric reference frame afterwards. So this is uh, what it looks like in G-plates. In, in, in the G-plates, we, we are using um, a mantle reference frame. So, so again, it's in Southern African coordinates. 701 is the plate code. Um, we have now made them in 10 million years, and it goes to 124 million years, our latest. So here is... The Euler poles, latitude, longitude, angle, and again, when we put one there, and you can also put zero, you uh, you would relate this to the spin axis, and also the mantle. Be aware when you're doing a moving hotspot or hotspot reference frame, these are not sensitive to true polar wonder, so you don't have to worry about true polar wonder when you are when you are using these reference frames. It's only the palimpsestic reference frame which is which is um, susceptible to true polar wonder. Okay, so we have this moving hotspot reference frame, it's absolute, and now we're going to switch to paleomagnetic, but uh, I've already told you we don't know longitude from pale. how can you switch? So that was the biggest challenge when we wanted to do this in 2008, or we did it actually in 2005, how, how on earth should we, um, should we put these things together? So we're using a little... Um, analytical trick, but before that, I just want to just want to make a point here. I'll show you this diagram before. If I had a volcanic eruption in Oslo, let's say this is 60 degrees north, I record my dip of the field, the inclination, and my declination, so you kind of roughly points to what the North Pole, but it doesn't matter which longitude. So if I draw a meridian here, it doesn't matter. It was always have the same dip, so I don't know what the longitude. <coughs> I sometimes make the joke that longitude on planet Earth is something we made up anyway. You know, it, it goes through Greenwich, but you know, the French had it through Paris for many years, but they gave up. So the French got the meter, and the Brits got the longitude, got the zero longitude. So it's it's kind of a it's kind of a made up thing. But uh, it's important now for us to try to relate it to the Greenwich meridian. So. 
we're using an analytical trick, and it's the only way to really do it. When I said, um, when I don't really know where the longitude of a plate, the trick is actually try to find a plate which you think has moved the least in longitude. If you can, f if you f if you can find a plate which has never moved in longitude and you know it, then we have an absolute reference frame. And there are there are kind of two candidates which we know, and we and we. Can, which can be good, but Africa is definitely the best. It was in the center of Pangaea, and uh, also for the last hundred million years, I'm just showing you here now from different continents, if you look at Africa, how much has it moved in longitude according to, to, um, to, um, to a hotspot reference frame, you can see Africa the Kum has um, moved about 500 kilometer or about five degrees in the last hundred million years. So it's, it's, it's very stable since then. And it's probably been very stable since Pangaea. Probably moved a little, but it's, uh, that's one of the reasons why, why I rotate all my plate circuits to Africa, because that's probably the most uh, stable continent in longitude. Probably moved very little. When Pangaea breaks up, things are kind of, it's kind of radiating out of Africa. Africa, uh, the thing is, is moving northwards um, sl and slightly eastward for the last 100 million years. Also, Eurasia, Europe, you can say, would also be a good candidate if you only did it for the last 100 million years. But it would be disaster to use things like North America, which we know is, has been moving westward, and also um, South America or India, for that matter. All continents, which you know, have moved a lot in longitude would be disastrous if you're going to do what I'm, I'm going to do now. So Africa is an ideal candidate and uh, it has probably been extremely stable in, in longitude. So this is the analytical trick uh, we're doing. And we are now, look, there, there are ways of, of also checking if this is, is really, if it's really that um, stable in longitude through time. So this is what we are doing, and um, so what we're doing then, we, we have this moving hotspot reference frame. I'll show you how we made a parametric reference frame. Yeah, and I, this, this figure actually com combined. So I do a moving hotspot reference frame, 224 million years. I do my paramagnetic reference frame. Now you see there is a new correction, longitude correction. Okay, I'm saying Africa is... Um, hasn't moved much in longitude, but I know from the moving hotspot reference frame that it has moved um, uh, certain degrees uh, since 124 million years. So I, I have to take, I have to correct all my older data for that. Then I get a global hybrid reference frame. Then I do a true polar wonder correction, which I, I've shown you how we did. And in the end of the day, we end up with this, which I call a global hybrid true polar wonder. So this is what we look in the file, and these will, these get distributed in G plates when after we get them published. So again, here you see seven or ones. So up to 120 million years here now, I'm in, um, in moving hospital reference frame. Then I switch to a paleomag here at 130. And I told you earlier, when you calculate Euler poles from these uh, paleomagnetic reference frame, it gets zero. But because I've now made a correction for the known longitude since 120 million years, you see these values are not zero any longer. So now my dream is that I have a reference frame which I can relate things to the deep earth, for instance. So in this new model, it's actually nine degrees we, we do the correction. Maybe a little complication in this diagram, but the main thing by going through all these things here, we started with the plate circuits. That's what Wegener did. So it's a little, you can almost compare this to what Wegener, what are we, you can almost say, what have we learned in 100, 100 years? Well, Wegener, this is a hand drawing, Africa fix, and then South America and North America kind of hand drawn around. So you can call this a relative plate circuits. Uh, in 2000, this is a reconstruction from 2004, similar, because of Paleomag. We can also move it to the right, lati uh, to the right uh, latitude. This, so this is um, a relative reconstruction. But what we can do now is actually by having this uh, both longitude, also get longitude and latitude, we can uh, and do this 
through Polawana correction at a time, we can actually relate it to things in the deep mantle. And for instance, this is, I'm looking at heterogeneities in the lowermost mantle, which I will show in a minute, based on um, on a S-way tomography model, which is called S-mean, which I'll, I'll show a few few slides of. So now I'm going to show you my real motivation for the entire lecture. I talk to you. Why? Why am I doing this? And this is what I'm, I'm mostly interested in these days, but it's just a few slides in the end. <coughs> so after talking about the lithosphere and plate, and where the plates were and continents, just going to go shortly down on the core mantle boundary. So now, now we are looking 2,900 kilometers down at the core mantle boundary. And what all these models, it doesn't really matter which of these global models you take, you will see these... Um, these red blobs at the core mantle boundary, there is one beneath, so you, know, you can see the continents behind there, I hope. So we have one beneath Africa, and it has a troublesome name, comes from Ganero and McNamara, LLSVP, which means large, low shear velocity province. And uh, so there's one beneath Africa, there's one beneath Pacific, and they're almost 180 degrees antipodal, uh, this thing and they're equatorial centered, very equatorial centered. These are, this is an S-ray tomography model. These are not very big. There's only, it's only like three, three and a half per percent um, different from, from average. <coughs> and this red line here is important in this model. This, um, this is just a one percent difference, this thing here. But these are, this line in this model that turned out, this is very close to these these things are sticking up in the mantle a few hundred kilometers, I'll show you diagrams of it. And this red line here is, is very close to where you have the steepest gradients or where, or where the margins are the steepest. And that, so but this can, this differ from which tomography. This is again an S-mean model, but um, keep your eye on this thick line here. Well, this has been known for a long time that we have these things here, and Kevin Burke wants to have some simpler names, so he called the African one Tucson, and the other one from Jason, and so this is Tucson Wilson and Jason Morgan, two of the big pioneers in this game. My interest is, yeah, we have seen this, and it's been known for decades, but are they just current temporal phenomena? It's just something we have in a core metal boundary today, and if not, how long have they existed? That's my motivation to look at this, and many tomographers would say, Say this is this is just a current phenomenon, have maybe no relationship to the deep past, and I will try to convince you in just a few diagrams that this is not the case. And the other motivation is that well, we all know about plate tectonics. We learned it in high school. You know, it's. Um, Simple theory in many ways, a dozen plates, three types of plate boundaries, con uh, divergent, convergence, and transform. But all these red dots there, which are the hot spots, uh, doesn't really fit into this theory because according to this theory, of course, everything should happen on the plate boundary where you can say Iceland is the plate boundary, but I still think it's, it's uh, unrelated to the plate boundary. But uh, you can see in Africa, a lot of them, you know, these, are, these are really far away from plate boundaries. So, so today I have, I, I have this feeling, you know, it's like we have two theories. We have plate tectonics, and we don't really understand fully the coupling to the mantle, and then we have hot spots um, kind of living their own lives. And you're probably also aware that some people don't believe these hot spots are deep at all, that they are simply driven by plate driving forces. So, um, one of my motivation actually to generate a theory where we actually understand both the red dots and uh, and and plate tectonics in one theory. That's kind of my ultimate um, uh, my ultimate dream. And then we need this um, <coughs> absolute reference frame. But first, um, what other people have done? Let's just you know. On the previous map, I show a lot of hotspots. You know, there is 50 of them, and you know, many of them has probably nothing to do with plumes from the core mantle boundary or in the, somewhere in the mantle. Um, so, so many, many of them shouldn't really be in catalog. Here, you see some. Now, I've, I've showed these um, low, low velocity zone beneath Africa and Pacific. I showed this diagram before, and now I plot 
some of these hotspots where actually people have been arguing that these are really deep. And, and one of the sources is from tomography. This is a paper by Montali et al. She made a catalog. These are the stars with yellow circles. And what she said, well, it's hard to see these, um, to see plumes all the way down to the, in the lowermost mantle, but um, at least from what she claimed from her analysis, if she claimed she could see them from the top to the bottom based on both S-way and P-way tomography, she ended up with 10 of them. So out of full catalog of 50, she claimed that maybe 10 of them could be really deep. Uh, there are other ways of looking at Corteo et al. earlier, 2003. They, seem, they said things like, well, if you have a high helium-3, helium-4 ratios, and if they started with a large igneous province, that was another criteria. If, if there was a hospital track and it started with a large igneous province, that could be an indication it was deep. Now, there were also a paper by Ritzman and Allen. They said, well, if we see an um, anomaly in the upper mantle and we also see in the lower mantle, we might not see it all the way. It, it might um, look like a deep plume. If you plot them now, and focus on Africa specifically here, so if you plot some of these things, you, you can see, particularly for Africa, they show quite a nice, there's Iceland, a little to the north there, but you can see, you can see a pretty clear pattern that they seem to come from the margins of, this Af of the one here, which I claim to be deep, never in the middle. That's an important point. Because a lot of these models by Courtier, they show these coming as some sort of super volcano from the middle of these things. But you see them from the, from the margin. In the Pacific, so here is your own island, Hawaii, sitting. So Hawaii is sitting bang on my, this red line here, which is my marker. So Hawaii then would be, would, um, would fit into this thing as, as a deep plume. Um, there are others there, but you know, there's also, Pacific one seems to be, you almost got a hole in it here. So it, it's not, the correlation here is not as good as you see here with Africa when it comes to this thing. But it's also a little selective which one you, you take. Of course, to do this analysis, people have done, but you don't have to do any reconstructions. We do nothing, really. We just took, we take the locations today, <coughs> just drop them down to the coronal boundary, in this case, straight down, and we haven't really considered advection in the mantle. You can do that, and you actually improve this correlation a little, but, but there is no reconstructions involved. And uh, this is what it will look like in a cartoon. So here, so here is Hawaii then. Um, so what I'm tr trying to convince you is that we, this is one of these low velocity sounds here that um, these hotspots, which might be deep, are actually sore from the margins. We don't really understand exactly how this is happening. We think there might be a feedback to subduction. You have slabs coming down here, creeping along here. And um, so these are thermochemical piles. They're not. They're not just hotter, they're also denser, so they probably have a 2-3% higher density than the rest of the mantle. And uh, I would say maybe, if I look at this hotspot catalog, maybe about 20 hotspots will show this relation that they are from, from the margin. Another very nice one is Reunion, which is almost the antipodal of Hawaii, sitting around 20 degrees south. And uh, it's been active for 65 million years. So both Reunion and Hawaii are sitting, uh, what, I, what I consider they could be sourced by plumes from the margins of these things. And where you have the steepest part of the margin is actually that red line I've shown you earlier. It's about only 1% difference from, from a normal mantle. So there is no reconstruction. What well, well, we need after reconstruction. Uh, Absolute reference frame is we want to reconstruct, for instance, large igneous provinces. These are the most catastrophic on planet Earth. This is catastrophic melting of the upper mantle, but the discussion has been, is it, uh, is it really deep? Can it come from the core mantle boundary? And um, one of the most famous, of course, I mentioned Reunion, which is sitting down here now. And there is kind of a hotspot track going up here, and then it jumps over. And uh, we find a Deccan trap here at 65 million years. So, so if you do very simplistic reconstructions of India, of course, it will fall straight over the reunion where it is today. So this is uh, one of the one. But even though this has been done for many, many years, we still discover new things. 
even in tanks which the hospital track, for instance, for, for, uh, earlier on, were taking further down here, down to Chagos, in the work we are doing now. I don't think Chagos, Chagos was actually not part of the Indian plate. It was actually part of the African plate. It came out of here. You can see it beautiful here uh, at about 40 million years or something because of a ridge jump. So it's a little more complicated now how to reconstruct this uh, hotspot track. So we're going to focus now on large igneous provinces, many definitions of large igneous. This is just kind of a simplistic. They're mainly mafic, so mostly basalts. Uh, they have a large aerial extent and volumes. If they're in intraplate setting, and they're characterized by short duration, very fast. When it comes to uh, large aerial extent, as kind of in the fir uh, first catalogs by um, Aldholm and Coffin and Coffin and Aldholm, they actually put a minimum limit of 0.15 million square meter, which is actually not very big. And I have a feeling the only reason that was done was to get to Columbia River basalt, which is 0.16. So you got one American in there, except for the camp, which is about 200 million years. But, you know, some of these are maybe 5 to 10 million square meters. So the Columbia River basalt is a tiny little thing. And uh, it's the smallest, which actually made it into the original database when, when they... When, um, you also see later, to me, it's actually an anomalous, actually. It won't fit in with, um, with the rest of these things. So, of course, today, these large igneous provinces are kind of, um, they're kind of all over the pl plate tectonics and move them around. So, if you, the previous map actually showed a uh, large igneous province for the last 300 million years, and um, they're kind of randomly spread around the planet. And... Um, and I'm now going to reconstruct them and just show some um, kind of normal reconstruction first. This is an example, 300 million years, we had a big one in Europe, we call the Skagrat centered uh, large igneous province, probably at a center out in the Skagorak, not far from Oslo, so about 300 million years. 250 million years, we also had a big one in Siberia, the Siberian traps. So we have about 25 of these which have different ages. And, these things are not happening every day. These are periodic. So uh, part of uh, not to understand. Uh, so yeah. So 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 they are episodic, and there is about twenty-five of them for the last twenty million years ago. Just want to show you now the way I reconstruct this. Instead of, of course, I can take. Um, all my polygons with the, with the distribution of the lavas and the dikes or whatever and reconstruct it all. But what I normally do, I try to, I try to estimate where the plume center was in these large igneous provinces. And that's not always very easy. So, for instance, from this oldest one, 300 million years, which I call the um, S here, Skagrak, um, a large igneous province, I, I find a center and then I reconstruct it. So in this case, so now we're looking at the African large, low shear velocity province again. And I show you earlier the, a number of these um, present day hotspots fall along the margin here, like the reunion sitting down here. And when I reconstruct it, you see that it also falls. Now, this line, which used to be red in the earlier, it's white, is to 1%. So it's what I would call the plume generation sounds. When I reconstruct these things now in my absolute reference frame, they fall on the margins. But there are errors involved, a lot in that, where, where is the center? There's also saying we should be aware of what we call upside down drainage. If you have a plume impinging on a sick lithosphere, it would very likely propagate and try to find a zone of weakness. Could be an old suture, could be an active rift. And also if you're very close to a spreading axis, let's say you had an eruption here, it can propagate up and interact with, uh, with the ridge axis. So there are, there are uncertainties there. So this is my kind of warning for doing this, that locating plumer higher resolution final clump can perhaps be unrealistic. So we talk about some five degrees uncertainty in this game. So this is just an example of doing one of them. And just to show you, so now we're looking at this where I estimated the center. I put, I put it here. So, so I'm, I'm looking now. So I'm sitting here talking to you from Oslo now. 
So we, we, we have a lot of volcanics, or silts and dikes, and uh, we thought the center was here. It propagated into the Oslo Rift, into Sweden here, Skåne, a lot of dikes. So a lot in Germany, a lot of into the North Sea. And you can see it also propagate way into England here. And here's this wind cell. This was, this was the one created Pallymagon in 1954, and it was the only pole which fitted um, what we know of Europe today. But you can see the prop. If these are all connected, and you can see from the ages here, it, these are about 300 million years older than these are very high, high resolution, most of them uranium lead ages. But you have a propagation there for more than a thousand kilometers, it's propagated into England. So this just illustrate this thing about figuring out exactly where the, where the plume is impinging the lithosphere, easily be five degrees wrong. But anyway, if we do that for all the one I, I show you earlier, so here is the same one now, it's this 297 uh, is, is the mean age. So if I reconstruct the centers of all these large igneous provinces, and remember, they came from a more or less random situation. Uh, here's a young one of far, 31 million years. You can see now they fall on this line here. You can see Dakan, of course, this is where the reunion is today. So, uh, which is 65 million years. You can go in the South Atlantic, look at the Perenat and Deca, about 100 and, it's actually 134 to be precise. Look at Karoo, 180. Camp, 200. This is the North Atlantic Igneous Province to the north of this area. You can see the Siberian traps is uh, it's this one, 251. Might be slightly anomalous. You can see all these things there are on the edges of these tanks. I think this African low velocity sound is actually going up here. This could be an arm, or some is actually saying there might be a small low velocity sound uh, beneath where the Siberian traps were sourced in this case. And if we do reconstruction into the Pacific, which is not easy because we're now looking at large igneous provinces more than 140 million years, and you know there is. There, there is no way of quanti quantitative relative fits from this system and into the Pacific, but still there seems to be a similar. But you can see the big, big anomaly is the Columbia River, and that's the youngest one, 15 million, also the smallest. That's clearly sitting over blue, cold, deep mantles. So Columbia River basalt is a big um, anomaly. But, but most of these others are clearly related to these. Um, so if... I asked in the beginning when I showed this map, which says monitor has been interesting, you know, is this just a present day phenomenon or has it been there for a long time? Well, this correlation, when I take all these large igneous provinces, with now different from up to 300 million years, and I reconstruct them, and I can still see an association with the deep mantle, this is not the current phenomenon. It has been at least like that for 300 million years. So these plumes that give rise to these lips emerge from the margins, see very nicely here. But a really big conclusion is that these red blobs there, or these thermochemical piles, must have been roughly in the equatorial antipodal, you know, and they're almost 180 degrees apart, for the last 300 million years. And um, this stability immediately created in shouting in the geodynamic community because how can things be stable for so long? And they couldn't model it, but now they are slowly being able to model it, so then I'm more happy. So this is again, I throw this thing here, we have these two antipodal, just show you, many hotspots, maybe up to 20, including Hawaii, which is sitting there, bang on, um, fits in there, has another reunion sitting on the other side, and if I reconstruct these large igneous provinces, so here's the large igneous provinces, they, they also, they seem to be sourced by plumes from the margins of these things. And these things are sticking up a few hundred kilometers into the mountain. And we, we also know, for those who are interested in that, if you look at, it's a degree two world and also the long wave um, gravity field, if you look at the geoid, you see the geoid highs are also associated with these tanks. And other geo heights you also find in this, which is perturbed in the subduction zone. So this is the kind of pattern just of, um, of some of the proposed deep hotspots and re reconstructed large igneous provinces. Um, 
which shows that this um, pheno- these things must have been stable for at least 300 million years. I think they've been stable much, much longer. But we can, we can prove it pretty well. And um, for those who want to dwell into this in great detail, I listed a number of references here, which, um, which are based on the talk. And that's the end.